Good morning, friends, and uh, welcome to this uh, ORF Fellows Seminar Series, uh, which is being uh, organized today under the auspices of uh, ORF Center for New Economic Diplomacy. Uh, my name is Navdeep Suri. I spent about 36 odd years in the Indian Foreign Service, and after retirement, I joined ORF uh, in January this year um, and uh, joined as Distinguished Fellow and also as Director for this Center for New Economic uh, Diplomacy. Uh, the topic that we have today is fascinating. It's about environmental security in the Sundarban in the current climate change era and whether uh, stronger India-Bangladesh cooperation can contribute uh, to this. Uh, I must start off on a slight uh, personal note that about uh, eight years back uh, with my family, I made uh, this um, amazing visit to Sundarban, spent about three days uh, in the area. And I had... Um, just finished reading uh, Amitav Ghosh's Hungry Tide. Uh, and, and between the, uh, uh, the visual impact of the book and the experiential uh, impact of the visit itself, it just left such an um, indelible impression on our, uh, our minds that if, if there's one place on the planet that we, we want to go back to, uh, it is, uh, is Sundarban, and uh, hopefully we'll be able to do that at some point. Uh, which is why I'm very keen that we have this uh, discussion today uh, on um, what can be done collaboratively between India and Bangladesh. Um, we have uh, an excellent lineup today. Uh, there's going to be the uh, author's presentation uh, by Anamitra Anurag Danda, who is a senior visiting fellow at ORF. Uh, uh, Anamitra, I would uh, request you to take about 15 minutes uh, for your presentation. Uh, yes, and then we have two distinguished panelists. We have Dr. Sumrati Patnaik, uh, research fellow at the IDSA, uh, followed uh, by Dr. Shugata Hazra, who is a professor of coastal zone management at Jadavpur University. And then uh, we'll have a short uh, Q&A session. And I'm very happy that we have uh, uh, our uh, senior colleague, uh, Ambassador Pinak Chakravarti, uh, amongst the participants today. And uh, we'll request him to also join in and give a, a, a couple of comments from his perspective as a former Indian High Commissioner uh, to Bangladesh. Um, so um, let's get this uh, on the road. Um, I'll hand over the floor uh, to Anamitra Anurag Danda. Uh, good morning. Thank you, sir. And uh, I will start with a small presentation and I will remain within the 15 minutes time period so that you're kindly allowed. I'm very happy to see uh, the panelists. And so you also announced that Professor Chakravarti would be joining. Uh, in fact, all three of them have been part of a conversation that has been uh, going on. And of course, ORF, uh, Delhi has been playing a lead role in that. And much of uh, the presentation itself um, has taken advantage of that conversation. Of course, my uh, involvement in the area and my interest goes back uh, more than 20 years. So uh, that conversation did help me, but of course, uh, I have also had an opportunity to contribute, which I'm happy to share today. So I will start with a small presentation. Uh, I hope the presentation is visible. Yeah, it is basically just take it in the presentation mode. Yeah, okay. So uh, this is in the context of the uh, MOU that India and uh, Bangladesh signed, uh, sorry. In 2011, uh, uh, on conservation of Sundarban. And uh, so this is the context in which uh, I begin. I also um, argue that uh, the view that this uh, instrument takes uh, is probably narrower than what it should be given the complexity of the region, given the uh, scale of the challenges. And I will briefly talk about the challenges themselves and therefore within the context of this uh, cooperation mechanism, what could be uh, 
the further development in terms of uh, cooperation between India and Bangladesh in general and on conservation of Sundarban in particular. This particular uh, instrument of cooperation had eight articles. I will not discuss all of them, but uh, a couple of them uh, are of immediate relevance because Sundarbans is well known for its biodiversity. I will come to that in a moment. But the article two itself uh, starts by saying that uh, exploitation of resources of the Sundarbans for development and poverty elevation of the people. And that the landscape is hugely influenced by the uh, people who are resource dependent. So despite the fact conservation of Sundarban would automatically mean the conservation of the natural area, uh, but it does take into account the human influence. Uh, yet I think it is still a narrow view. Uh, and I will make that argument in a moment. <clears throat> the Article 6 of the uh, MOU uh, gives a fairly uh, large list of envisaged activities, and some of them, of course, uh, can take us forward in terms of dealing with some of the challenges that we expect in times of climate change. Uh, yet, uh, for, for a sense of reference, this is where the Sundarbans is in the encircled circle, uh, red uh, circle. And as you can see, uh, it, it essentially is the point where all the rivers, Himalayan rivers, drain into the Bay of Bengal and thus the Delta came into being. And therefore, anything that happens upstream has a bearing on uh, uh, on what happens in the Sundarbans, to the ecosystem, to the uh, valued species, and to the people who also inhabit the region. And within the Bay of Bengal, uh, because uh, it plays such a huge role as the nursery for biodiversity resources, has a bearing on the northern Bay of Bengal fisheries along the coast of Odisha, um, uh, Andhra Pradesh, Bangladesh, Myanmar, and possibly Thailand as well. Uh, it is well known for its biodiversity. Uh, in this illustration, if one were to look at it carefully, would see a number of these species that are so valued and keep the ecosystem the way it is. And the tiger itself uh, is the icon for the Sundarbans for the simple reason that uh, this is the only uh, mangrove habitat inhabited by the tiger. <clears throat> no other mangrove area has a predator at its apex as majestic as this. Okay. So this is the uh, natural area uh, that hasn't changed its borders significantly since 1947, except for a little patch on the Indian side, which in terms of designation still retains its designation as forest compartment, but uh, de facto it is an inhabited area. And this happened uh, when there was a lot of uh, dislocation of human population from further east. And uh, there was a little incursion, uh, but that was restored back to uh, the forest, which has its own controversy. And this is not the time to take it up. Maybe some other discussion, some other time. Uh, despite the fact that we have a shared history of the Sundarbans and uh, the ecoregion, however, uh, has a, a different connotation in the two countries. On the Indian side, uh, the Sundaban ecoregion essentially means the area that was historically forested. And when I say historically forested, it means the mapping that was carried out during 1829-30, around that time, the extent of the forest, uh, which is essentially all the area that you see on the map on the western side, 
uh, on the left of your screen is the Indian side, is treated as Sundaban, whereas in Bangladesh, it is only the forested area that is uh, known as uh, Sundaban. Uh, this somehow needs to be addressed if we want to progress on the uh, on, on, on progress on the basis of a shared understanding. So either we could take only the natural area, which would then be this, but if we were to take uh, the human into account based on Article 2 and 3 of the MOU under discussion, then we are possibly looking at a population of about one and a half million uh, based on 2011 census, half a million on the Indian side and about a million on the Bangladesh side. Of course, there are other ways of uh, delineating the Sundarbans. It could be the original forest boundary of 18. Uh, 2930, or it could be the tidally active areas. It is for the two governments to come to a decision, and which is mentioned in the MOU that they will arrive at that understanding. However, uh, there is a lot of unknown about the ecosystem, uh, and the um, instrument of cooperation that is the MOU does not necessarily uh, address all of them. Some of the unknowns are uh, the structure and the structure of the ecosystem and function of species, uh, despite the fact that the inventories are fairly exhaustive. Species, both aquatic and terrestrial, are well documented both in Bangladesh and in India. Uh, but in terms of the changes underway and anticipated, uh, we really don't understand uh, the ecosystem as much. Again, keeping Article 2 and 3 in mind, we know um, that there are people dependent, but again, uh, we don't know the stock of resources and therefore how much can be taken and how many can be supported and whether it can contribute significantly or moderately or totally to poverty alleviation. Of course, risk of endangerment and local extinction is addressed by Article 4. Impact of climate change is addressed by Article 5. The known consequences are, of course, ad hoc management decisions, ad hoc number of permits and licenses that are issued to locals for resource exploitation, which also remains ad hoc. What we know is uh, the historical temperature rise and the projected temperature rise, which at the end of the century could be anywhere between one degree uh, and 3.7 degrees Celsius on average, uh, given the, depending on the trajectory the world takes. And as of now, mm, the signs are not very encouraging. We also know uh, cyclonic activity is uh, well documented in this region. And within the mm, cyclonic activity, it is projected that the cyclonic storms and higher category events are likely to increase. And recorded document also, uh, recorded documentation also shows that there is a rise in the number of high intensity events, although the overall number remains uh, pretty much the same. We also know that there have been a number of discontinuities of the tributaries uh, sorry, distributaries of the river, river Hooghly that would bring freshwater and silt to the system. And some of it is natural, some of it is man-made in terms of uh, infrastructure that has come up. And uh, the Western part, uh, the Indian part, uh, is a major sufferer uh, of such consequences. And of course, there is a natural tilt eastward, which also takes most of the silt and water to the the sun of the Sundarbans. The other known is abstraction of groundwater and its impact on subsidence of the delta. And this is just a representation for the Calcutta metropolitan area, which draws hugely, uh, despite the fact that the river flows right through the um, metropolitan area. In terms of the known consequences, we know there has been both uh, net land loss over a period of time, and the rate of loss of land is actually increasing uh, over the decades, 
and it is uh, Professor Hazra's team which has been documenting this and studying this for decades now. Uh, this is also from one of his studies which says during the last decade we've lost on the Indian side landmass to the extent of about five and a half square kilometers per year. Going forward in terms of projections, this is a projection for 2050 and uh, the details are here. The red areas show that uh, during the mid-century, unprotected, these areas are likely to be under the high tide flooding on a daily basis. <clears throat> flooding already happens. It uh, impacts agricultural areas, it impacts habitation, it makes uh, life difficult for children in their schools. Schooling itself becomes a challenge, and of course, houses have to be abandoned in certain places. So this is already happening. Going forward, this is only going to get more acute. And that means uh, the pressure on the ecosystem for resources is likely to increase. In fact, studies and observations post-disaster uh, reflect this phenomenon time and again. And therefore, in the context of the cooperation, which says that a joint working group will uh, take, the, uh, uh, take, take the cooperation forward. As of now, I am aware of only one such meeting, and it was not necessarily a broad-based uh, meeting. It did not have uh, participation outside the government on the Indian side. One of the delegates from Bangladesh was, of course, a non-governmental uh, delegate. Uh, the suggestion that I am making is for the JWG, the Joint Working Group, to work towards a mechanism that can uh, take into account the scale of the challenges, the scale of the geography, starting from the Himalayan rivers on which the delta is dependent, and of course, the um, benefits that accrue to a large area uh, and just not the local population in the Sundaban region itself. And therefore, uh, at the very top, I have talked about a ministerial uh, council for uh, essentially uh, deciding on the direction of cooperation. I've talked about uh, a steering committee that is uh, essentially made up of uh, technocrats and bureaucrats. I've talked about a uh, platform uh, where a lot of the conversation happens. And uh, it is uh, where the programmatic decision-making takes place. I have suggested that there be institutional members who send delegates to this platform. And when I say institutional members, it is not restricted to uh, the government alone. It is uh, to broad base the perspective and the problem uh, the way the problems are viewed in the academia, in the civil society. To incorporate all of that, I have uh, suggested two uh, bodies, essentially um, institutional member associations that can send delegates to the platform. And I have also suggested uh, two advisory bodies in the countries, which can take in also individuals and uh, anybody and everybody who is interested and is a stakeholder. Uh, Three and, minutes, uh, Dr. Danda. Sure. And of course, a uh, secretariat uh, to, to coordinate, to be a repository of information, to provide analysis to all of these various uh, decision-making entities that are being pr uh, proposed at the political leadership level, at the uh, technocratic and bureaucratic uh, policy formulation, decision-making level, and of course, at the programmatic level. I have also suggested that there be working groups, and these are not new uh, entities. These are organs of the government, government of India, government of Bangladesh, government of West Bengal. Uh, in fact, uh, while I was writing this paper, I did not think beyond West Bengal at that point in time. But today I am also making the suggestion that the riparian states uh, of India, 
be part of this. The maritime states that derive benefit in terms of the fishing nursery that the Sundarbans is be part of this so that the decision making can be as broad as possible, as informed as possible. And this is why initially I said that the view that the instrument of cooperation has taken is rather narrow because in terms of solutions to the challenges, uh, which I will not take up right here, uh, will demand cooperation across a much wider area than the Sundarbans itself. Uh, Ambassador Suri, I'll stop here. So I think I'm willing That is brilliant. Um, excellent presentation, lots of food for thought. Uh, but I'm going to move uh, this across to Dr. Sumrithi Patnayak uh, as the first panelist to give her comments. Uh, thank you, sir. And uh, let me first uh, say that uh, the moment I got to know that Anurag is presenting, I was thinking it, it will be very, very difficult to comment on Anurag's paper because it is extremely comprehensive. And uh, in fact, uh, during some of our meetings, I would say that I learned from him a lot, uh, you know, coming from the background of uh, something like strategic studies where uh, Sundarban is, uh, you know, part of the joint cooperation mechanism, which Anurag has mentioned uh, that exists between the two countries. Uh, however, I will just uh, give a few points, though I think the recommendations given by Anurag is really, really comprehensive. And some of those recommendations we also discussed uh, among ourselves in our various meeting as part of the BISCRI forum, uh, which we have between uh, ORF, IDSA, then few organizations from West Bengal and also from the Bangladesh side. Uh, I would like to, first is that I think we need to look, like Anurag starts his uh, paper by bringing in the various facet of the MOU, which uh, has been agreed between the two countries. Now, the thing is that, uh, of course, in any context, uh, MOU is actually not binding. And that perhaps is one of the reasons we had only one meeting uh, not that, uh, you know, lately we found uh, that uh, this mechanism is extremely uh, important for India and Bangladesh, just to save the mechanism, because the MOU says uh, that it is, uh, you know, it is agreed for five years. So if you don't have a single meeting for five years, uh, then obviously the MOU will lapse. So perhaps just to take care of that, uh, one meeting took place in, uh, you know, in uh, uh, the 2016, and I'm very sure there will be one meeting in 2020 or, you know, 2021, because uh, otherwise, again, in 2021, the MOU will lapse. So I think, you know, that actually tells you a lot about the two states' priorities, which Anurag also has mentioned in his paper. The prioritization of Sundarban receives very less attention among the policymakers. Some of the time during our meetings, we have really transited from the MEA speaking to the JSBM, then going to the MOEF, uh, just to you know, see to it that somewhere we, if we can uh, you know, clog into the meeting, at least providing in terms of the input, not in a formal structure, but in a, any kind of informal um, setup. But that also has not uh, happened. And uh, presently, it is stuck uh, in MOEF. Though we tried to uh, you know, get it through the MEA, even we met the Bangladesh High Commissioner then, but things did not move uh, you know, just before. Of course, the visit got canceled because of the COVID uh, situation in Bangladesh. But uh, we saw a bit of reluctance in, the, in terms of the MOEF's attitude. The MOE, MEA was much more forthcoming as far as the Sundarban cooperation is concerned. You know, that, that is my experience. A second issue is that the relationship between the state and center, you know, where Anurag rightly says that we need to bring in not just the upper riparian uh, states within the Indian Union, as well as the maritime state, but even, you know, uh, forging any kind of cooperation between West Bengal and Delhi also has become a challenging task. You know, there is a lot of political sensitivities which is concerned. West Bengal, which is the primary stakeholder of Sundarban, actually doesn't get the space where it can actually, you know, take up the leadership. Of course, from the Bangladesh side, 
always the question comes that you know we are a sovereign country so we are not going to negotiate with west bengal you know the negotiation uh, negotiating part is delhi which is which is, uh, which is uh, correct but but in this kind of contestation the the victim is the local stakeholder and anurag has brought those points very you know really uh, into his paper so it is not just only the climate change the soil erosion the question of embankment the salinity which is affecting the day to day life of the people in in this particular region but it is also about the lack of coordination and lack of priority which is accorded to sundarban by both the countries i think that is one of the issues the second issue which i would say that uh, of course i would like to add here of course the vast elect there is a vast electorate which is present in sundarban and i'm really surprised that how come you know when the political leadership always goes out of their way to cater to a you know to nearly you know a huge majority of electorate which is present here and how come there is no attention uh, which is given even by the bjp which wants to you know make a presence in west bengal so that that uh, you know i found it a little surprising but on the bilateral context and two of the issues remain significant and may perhaps explain to some extent uh, the reluctance of the two states uh, could be the rampal project which has been completely politicized in bangladesh and there has been a lot of demonstration uh, in uh, dhaka regarding uh, you know this this particular project so probably the two states would like to treat very carefully as far as sundarban is concerned because the moment the sundarban comes at that particular moment the rampal issue also uh, will come so it is it is a kind of connected issues and the second issue is of course 2026 we are going to have the faraka negotiation uh, because 30 years uh, since 1996 <coughs> so that again will bring in the issue of the salinity uh, of the erosion of how uh, faraka is responsible for what we see you know the points which anurag has made uh, in his papers so i think these two issues also uh, would be very very significant because i think uh, the political sensitivities in the context of sundarban is very very um, in a sense uh, you know very apparent when you speak to the stakeholders and this entire narrative what is missing is the local stakeholders you know perhaps uh, anurag has mentioned uh, about the maritime states and the upper riparian states here if i can add not just you know there has to be some sort of coordination between the local stakeholders at the panchayat level and also at the level of the district and the state uh, those uh, it is very uh, interesting to note that at least uh, in the context of west bengal they have a minister for sundarban and uh, so that that actually shows the keenness uh, you know which uh, sundarban uh, has in the in the government of west bengal context but uh, in the on the bangladesh side there are also multiple stakeholders but i'm not very sure but to me it appeared the multiple stakeholders seem to uh, be very open about the cooperation on the bangladesh side because the moment you meet the mofa people in dhaka they immediately say that you know you go and speak to the ministry, ministry of environment and i i have always seen they're much more forthcoming uh, in terms of uh, you know the cooperation but i don't somehow you know it may be a kind of you know i may not have that kind of knowledge to say but whatever little interaction i have i have always seen the moef is a reluctant partner so in 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 this kind of cooperation we where you have multiple or you know organization multiple institutions which are participating from both the countries and if there is not uh, much cooperation uh, or coordination among them uh, regarding the likelihood of having a kind of structure where where the government cannot move some of the uh, issues where the where which the government is not un, you know not very comfortable perhaps can be discussed in the bistri forum and uh, which anurag has brought about and that was the entire idea of arguing why bistri forum becomes very important institutional framework at the non governmental level uh, which takes into uh, cognizance the existence of the formal structure of the government but uh, also at the same time uh, recognizes the large pool of knowledge which is available outside of the ministry i think that 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 is uh, extremely significant and unless and until we pull in the local knowledge and the stakeholders 
I think you know this will remain a kind of governmental cooperation. And when you are when you are dealing with issues of livelihood, uh, environment, and other issues, you know, which also you know this is one of the uh, place which is uh, really poverty stricken. You just cannot uh, you know have any kind of planning not taking into account the local stakeholders. Thank I you. I just end my uh, you know discussion point here. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you so much. Um, we'll. Saved the best for the last. So, Professor Hazra, over to you. Yeah. Uh, I mean, good afternoon. I mean, I think uh, I have had one of the best papers uh, in the context of not only Sundarban, but also for environmental security and uh, climate action in this total eco region. So, I must congratulate Onurag at the onset. And uh, I just want to share some of uh, there are my students, including Onurag, at some point of time, uh, that uh, any kind of management action depends on the threat perception. The perception of threat, say for health system breakdown, was not there before this outbreak of COVID. And uh, now that kind of actions that we are taking, that 45 days lockout, 54 days lockout, and huge loss of economic revenue was unthinkable when we are always pleading about, look, let us do something for our rejuvenation of the health system. Let us spend something, uh, some budget of, for that. And, or let us take care of the emerging diseases like dengue, malaria, SARS, uh, maybe Nipah, maybe Ebola or COVID now. Nobody was paying attention to it. Nobody was paying attention to reduction of carbon emission, but now if I come up with a threat, which is slow onset like climate change, slow emergence of the island, so slow uh, submergence of the largest carbon sink of the globe, that is the Sundarban forest, it still doesn't become a threat perception in the, uh, you may say, the, in the polity of India or in Bangladesh. But so, I mean, this is the point why from 2011, we couldn't succeed making another meeting of the joint platform. So in that perspective, I think I will place uh, Anurag uh, proposal or thesis and try to uh, I mean, analyze it that why he has named as a environmental security problem because he has discussed problem of forest, problem of ecotourism, problem of transboundary cooperation why it is environmental security problem. So the security problems comes when you think of the, again, the, uh, I mean, uh, I mean the predictions from the scientific community that Onurag has shared that this part of the Delta is more or less a laboratory for learning about climate change impact and how many people are getting displaced day by day by the slow onset disasters of sea level rise. It took, uh, uh, 2019 to admit the government of India that we are shouting from 2000 onwards that we are facing the highest rate of sea level rise and that in 2019 parliament government of India has acknowledged that uh, the highest sea level rise in India is at Shundabon and we are losing island we are talking about loss of mangrove area we are talking about loss of human habitation area and forced migration forced climate migration from the our part and also from the Bangladesh. This is an environmental threat. This is an environmental security problem. If with that kind of sea level rise uh, and the prediction for 2050, if suddenly 1.5 million people want to come across the border of Bangladesh and try to enter India, what we are going to do with them? Push them back, have a military action, this is an environmental security problem. So unless we can present the threat of climate change and human existence and the existence of the delta and the mangrove forest, if we deal about species and diversities only and the impact of climate change, the graph, in the, we keep it in the scientific realm, we are lost. What we have lost is uh, not be able to do in the last 10 years is a people's initiative because then uh, you just analyze the Onurag concept that environmental security in the Delta, it involves 
the achieving the goal of SDG 14 and 15, that is life on land and life below water. And it involves SDG goal of one, two, three, and six. That is no poverty, no hunger. Uh, I mean, good health and water for all. That is not there in Sundar So, And the climate change era that he has mentioned, it is also involving SDG 13 and SDG 16. So you, you can now see that the entire effort of these uh, India Bangladesh poor portion and is now in your, your action for climate in the country, both the countries, at both the countries ability and readiness to act on the sustainable development goal. They are in the 161 and 160 positions in the sustainable development metrics. So both are in a very vulnerable situation. So both have to improve quite a lot with this in the UN SDG dashboard framework. So you can see that a lot of, I mean, overlapping interest of integrated coastal zone management, disaster management, it needs to collaboration. So these proposal of this joint platform needs to be viewed from all these angle of sustainable development, integrated disaster management, because big disaster like tsunami needs cooperation from say India, Bangladesh, Thailand, these, these that all Bay of Bengal areas. So big disaster like climate change, we need cooperation from Bangladesh and India, not only for this Delta region, but for, for the entire country as a whole. So here I can see that this link of with the SDGs can be incorporated uh, in the plan. And then we can probably <laughs> go with the, uh, to the government. The third point I like to make that uh, there's a fantastic new contribution in science from Onurag's paper that I could find in this last 30, 40 years that I'm working with Sundarban that in this paper, he has first published a map of joint India Bangladesh with the Dampier Hodges line. This line was missing. It was uh, there in the Indian part from our uh, uh, 2002 maps. But I was unable to get this uh, in the Bangladesh part. But he has meticulously searched, researched, and finally could pro produce that blue line, which demarcates the extension of the 1830 forest area. So that is the forest the Britishers and the colonial uh, people have cleared it. And now it is our time to give something back to the nature in the face of climate change and sustainable development challenges. So this is a very new addition. And the second new addition is the mention that we want to do a sediment and water management, not ecotourism management in the priority, sediment and water management in the Delta. So immediately broadens the scope of the MOU. You cannot manage sediment in the only 19 blocks of Sundarban. You have to manage it from the apex of the Delta. So you need a joint, Treaty on India, Bangladesh, water sharing, forest sharing, tiger sensors, these that everything comes together. So it becomes a delta management plan that the Bangladesh is having now with the collaboration of uh, foreign uh, I mean, scientists. But we must develop a delta management plan in an integrated approach to manage this total transboundary ecosystem, where, which otherwise is going to be a threat to environmental security for both the countries. One country is going to lose huge amount of people, the human resource, and other country will be faced with what to do with this climate refugees kind of problem. So this is the fourth problem of the new science contribution that should be, should broaden the scope of the move that uh, Anurag has proposed, but with this existing framework with his proposals, with this existing MOU, how this can be revitalized. I must support what is the own, what is plan, uh, plan proposed by Onurag, that is a institutional framework to spearhead this, uh, I mean, management, joint management uh, with a ministerial committee. Then there is a steering committee with the state participations and the central court collaboration. And the third level is the joint working group where these, uh, platform, uh, uh, social, uh, I mean, the civil society organizations like this, uh, this three uh, comes into actions. But what I try to emphasize that these kind of MOUs, which has been now kept in the domain of the forest conservation only, if it has to be broadened in the, uh, in the realm of Delta management, 
then what we need to do a, 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 ha, to establish a very strong advocacy group involving people like uh, Dr. Uh, Navdeep or others from uh, different parts of the civil society and scientific community. So who will go on campaigning and doing advocacy to the minister, to the government, to the voters even? Because the voters will demand in the next election that have you achieved, uh, what is your plan to achieve the sustainable development goal in the Delta? How you are going to reduce my 39% of poverty? How you are going to address my food insecurity of the 43% of people in the Delta, Indian part? So that is the same question he may ask, that how you are going to save my habitat, my island, that I'm losing land. What you are going to do? So, I mean, so this becomes a very emerging crisis. Perception and our ability both of the civil society and the media, which needs to be involved again, to campaign, to sensitize the government, to the policymakers, that look, this will uh, be a bigger threat of, than COVID. Because finally we may yeah. find a vac vac vaccine against COVID, but we will have no vaccine against climate change. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Hazra. And, and I can see that there have been several questions uh, pouring in. But uh, before we move to the questions, um, can I request uh, uh, Ambassador Pinat Chakravarti? Uh, Akhil, can you unmute his mic or can he do that and uh, just uh, make a couple of comments? Uh, okay, thank you very much for including me. Uh, I'm not a scientist. I'm, uh, I come from a different, I approach this whole issue from a different angle. And that is from the bilateral, diplomatic, strategic uh, sort of perspective. I have been involved in this uh, discussions for quite some time. But uh, the ultimate goal that we had sought, uh, that is to build a joint platform, uh, has not really happened. Now, there are many reasons why mm, it has not happened. I will not go into them. But let me put some very broad perspective on, uh, as, a, as a sort of caveat to whatever has been said. One thing that this is not the time to overload the agenda. The post-COVID situation in, in our countries will be very, very difficult. And one of the difficulties will be that of finding uh, money to fund many of these activities which now will not have the same priority as, uh, as you know, looking after the people, finding them jobs, etc. So that is one caveat that I want to put in. Hence, uh, this template of uh, suggestions that we expand a lot of these things into and bring in various other aspects apart from what we had begun with, that is basically conservation and preservation. Uh, I think we should remain with that. I mean, this is a piece of advice that I think you sh some people who will follow this up should keep in mind. Now, uh, one thing that Anurag said uh, struck me is that he talked about the upstream issues. I think we all know that uh, upstream issues mean, of course, as Professor Hazra also said, sedimentation, water flow, and all those things. So as soon as we mention the word water, I think we run into uh, what we, um, uh, what we, I would say, uh, a main issue that uh, continues to, that both these countries continue to grapple with. That is sharing of water. Of course, that is a different issue, but ultimately it gets all clogged up in that debate as to how much water, what is the, why is there so less water, now that is another whole debate why we have less water, more people, you know, more intensive agriculture, etc. and all that. So what do we do? We are really actually in a no-win situation. That uh, can you reduce the population? Can we stop cultivating, you know, having, having water intensive cultivation? I don't know. I mean, those are issues that need to be discussed. But at the same time, if we cannot stop those activities or some regulate those activities, then water, I'm afraid, will not, uh, we all know what is happening to water, how much water is reducing during the lean season. Hence, that is one aspect, and I would say a big hurdle in carrying this forward, because every time you talk about it, 
the Bangladeshis, I'm a, by the way, is this Chatham House rules? <laughs> um, please go ahead. Don't worry. That's right. I shouldn't worry. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> say, say something provocative. No, you see, I am regarded as a very provocative person in Bangladesh because um, I, I speak my mind. So sometimes many people don't like me. So, but that doesn't matter really. One has to, when, when one is out of diplomacy, one can do that. So uh, basically what will happen is that this whole, and I think, I think if I'm not mistaken, the main issue of water and of course, I think uh, Smuti uh, mentioned the Rampal thing. These two aspects have been, uh, I think both sides have been wary of getting into a closer embrace on Sundarbans, primarily because of these two issues. Because each side will, um, Bangladesh side will certainly have to raise water. And uh, Rampal is something that they went ahead and it, was be it is being implemented by an Indian company. And there has been huge agitation, etc., on Rampal, and I shall not go into details. So I think uh, if we want this project to succeed, and even if, our, if without uh, building a joint platform, I think we should pick on small doables. Things like, um, I mean, let's begin at the really basic level, like training or mapping of certain things. Some, I think. Anurag's paper has a lot of suggestions on building, let's say, some embankments or dikes, etc., which will help in preservation and conservation. So I think we should begin at a very low level. There is a reluctance in engaging, I think, at the government level because of the reasons that I have out, um, underlined. But we right. cannot... But we cannot, but we cannot... Last, last uh, line, one or two. But we cannot... Um, discard it. We cannot simply discard it because climate change issues are there, migration issues are there. So I think let us begin, uh, get the two governments to consider or sort of try to persuade them to think of small, small steps rather than anything big, rather than, you know, getting in. And the last point I wish to make is that whatever consultations in India we have to do, let us do it internally. Let us not bring them onto any platform which engages them with Bangladesh or with Bangladeshi interlocutors. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ambassador Chakravarti. And uh, um, I can see there are a number of questions. Anurag, are you able to see those questions and uh, take them on? One by one? Uh, yes, yes. Uh, okay. Uh, do I have to type? Do I answer? How, how does it? No, no, I just answer. Just read the question and answer it, uh, to the person who's uh, posted. Uh, okay. Uh, Ambassador Chakravarti just uh, mentioned about keeping things small. And therefore, uh, what Biblob Chakravarti was asking, should this cooperation expand to all rebellion states, nations to make it uh, more impactful? Uh, ideally, yes. But given what Ambassador Chakravarti has just outlined, uh, maybe this is not the time. And in the post-COVID world, for some time, uh, that will hold. Uh, there was this question from Amitabh Abhanik, uh, quick remark on status of exploration of these forests by exploitation, I guess, of these areas by human influences like tourism. Uh, tourism takes place on the Indian side on a very restricted uh, zone. Uh, deforestation on the Indian side happens, again, at a very small scale. Um, uh, on a decadal scale, it is not great. In fact, the Forest Survey of India report uh, that it brings out every two years, in four years, sorry, uh, you will notice that uh, the extent of mangrove area in Sundarbans on the Indian side has actually increased. Uh, Yes, navigational and maritime activities and opportunities uh, do exist. In fact, the PIWTT, which is uh, a, a protocol that uh, Bangladesh and India uh, have uh, shared and renewed a number of times, is in place. Uh, inland uh, freight traffic takes place. In fact, now there is a standard operating procedure also on tourism within uh, transboundary tourism within that area and within the scope of the PIWD. 
how many people are residing in the Sundar Bans area, what are their economic activities. Now, this uh, depends on how we define the Sundarban area. If, the, if we define it the way uh, India defines, taking uh, the dampier Hodges line into account, uh, which was the extent of the forest in the 1830s, then according to 2011 census, that would be about seven and a half million people. Uh, but if we define it the way uh, Bangladesh does, uh, which is a 10 kilometer band of ecologically crit critical area abutting the natural area, then it would be only about uh, one and a half million. Uh, but because India takes all of it uh, into account, on our site was four and a half million as per 2011 census. Uh, economic, sustainable economic activity is essentially paddy agriculture and fishing. And a large section of the able-bodied men and women work as laborers, as unskilled uh, people in various sectors all over the country, and also some outside the country. Okay. Okay. Um, you, you know, uh, before we close, uh, and I come to my closing remarks, uh, I think uh, it's fair that um, um, we give... Uh, Dr. Smriti Patnayak and Dr. Professor Hazra, just uh, maybe a minute or so each to respond to any of the issues that have come up or on, uh, on what Ambassador Chakravarti said. I just uh, would like to add that uh, when Anurag was speaking about that inland water treaty which exists between the two countries, uh, there are certain issues of oil spillage which came up, if you remember, in the Sundarban area, which raised a lot of issues regarding the environment hazard of allowing uh, large scale transportation, especially the kind of boat where uh, it is not safe uh, to transport uh, certain uh, products. And that is number one. And number two, I completely agree. Nilanjan has asked about whether you know the data management can come in in the Faraka. I, I, I think I would be happy if both the countries can think of renewing the existing uh, Faraka Treaty as it exists between the two countries further, because there is a lot of reservation on both the sides. I just said here, thank you. Uh, and regarding the question on the sea level rise, I must say that there are, uh, depends upon the space and the time that we are considering. Government of India uh, published it as a five millimeter per year in the Sundarban Delta, depending upon the data from 1948 to 2014. But uh, depending upon the last 30 years data with John Pethick, has published, um, World Bank has published 8 millimeter per year. Our team in the shorter span of 2000 onwards has published 12 millimeter per hour, so uh, per year. So you can see that there is a change because of the time and uh, the space that we are measuring. And the second part regarding uh, uh, Dr. Chakraborty's suggestions of pruning the agenda and keeping it in the safe zone of where we can walk rather than going for a bigger ambit and not be able to uh, uh, work on that. I fully support that due to begin with, we should start with the problem which is already enlisted in the MO. At least some part of that we can start tracking. Otherwise, uh, it will be spoiled. So, from ecotourism to mangrove, for the health of the mangrove, which is deteriorating also here in this part. So, we can touch water, but we may not declare it that we are de uh, decide, uh, we'll be dealing with the water, but this will finally demand that to restore the health of mangroves, so increase the flow of water in the Sundarban ecosystem. Do you think, uh, just a question from my side to the uh, panelists and the author, uh, do you think it would be useful to uh, have uh, a conversation on these lines uh, with a wider scope that brings in uh, some of our friends from the Bangladesh side and uh, um, um, you know, engage with them uh, as well? And I mentioned this because um, uh, earlier this week uh, on um, the health and economic impact of uh, COVID, uh, we had a fascinating conversation with uh, uh, friends from Africa. And we had uh, um, you know, participants from 11 countries and uh, some of the uh, inputs were really of a high quality. So taking advantage of the platforms that we have, uh, is it something that you suggest that ORF should take up maybe in the next uh, uh, a couple of weeks or beyond? Surely, sir. That would be uh, a great opportunity, as you said, 
for uh, varied perspectives and ideas to come and across uh, nations. Though uh, Ambassador Chakravarti cautioned that uh, <laughs> we should keep these uh, discussions domestic, but the problem is not domestic. It, sp it spans across uh, boundaries, uh, and therefore, uh, I think it's a good idea. No, I think, I think the point there is uh, that, uh, and this is internationally, you know, we are not the only federal structure in the world, right? There are, the United States is a federal structure and Germany is a federal structure and so on. Australia is. Uh, and, and, and so uh, the, the, the more effective negotiating uh, approach is that you get your house in order first. And that can be as hard as negotiating overseas. Right. But, you right. know, it's important that first you line up the ducks within your country uh, make sure that the stakeholders are broadly aligned uh, yes. so that when you go overseas to negotiate or to, the, to with an external partner, you go with that clarity of, uh, of, of message that or right. of mandate right. that mandate that you have. And, 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 and I think that's that's crucial when you approach negotiations to have those internal systems in place uh, and obtain a clear mandate that you can then then take overseas. Um, but uh, once again, uh, an absolutely uh, enlightening uh, discussion. Uh, thank you very much to Anurag and, uh, of course, to uh, Dr. Smriti and to Professor Hazra for their um, for their comments. Uh, as you know, um, one of the activities that CNED um, uh, does is the Dhaka Dialogue, uh, and and we'll see how uh, in the lead up to the next uh, Dhaka Dialogue we can build upon and the, the conversation uh, that we've had. Um, some of the uh, suggestions, Anurag, that you've made in terms of the institutional um, uh, structures, um, we are happy to pass them on to uh, our friends in MEA and to see um, uh, whether they can, they can be taken up. Uh, with, of course, uh, Ambassador Pinak Chakravarti's uh, sobering uh, perspective that uh, uh, we are uh, in this uh, extraordinary uh, situation, and uh, uh, you know, uh, while the uh, while the long-term consequences of climate change are staring us in the face, in the face, there is a short-term reality, an immediate uh, crisis that uh, uh, that we have to deal with. Uh, so I'm reminded of uh, that old management uh, adage by Peter Drucker that a good manager is one who keeps his nose to the grindstone and eyes on the distant hills. Uh, so you've got to do both, keep that nose on the grindstone of today, uh, even as your eyes are on the distant hills. So uh, with that, I'm very happy that we've uh, finished on time uh, and look forward to more such conversations. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you.